Well, people sometimes ask me if I have any words of advice for young people. And here are a few simple admonitions. Never interfere in a boy and girl fight. <clears throat> Beware of whores who say they don't want money. In the long run, these are the most expensive whores what can be got. If you're doing business with a religious son of a bitch, get it in writing. Because his word isn't worth shit, not with the good Lord telling him how to fuck you on the deal. <laughs> if, after having been exposed to someone's presence, you feel as if you'd lost a quart of plasma, avoid that presence. You need it like you need pernicious anemia. We don't like to hear the word vampire here trying to improve our PR. Interdependence is the key word. Enlightened interdependence. Life in all its rich variety, take a little, leave a little. However, by the inexorable logistics of the vampiric process, they always take more than they leave. Avoid fuck-ups. Fools, I call them. You all know the type. Everything they have anything to do with turns into a disaster, no, how, no matter how good it may sound. Yeah. Trouble for themselves and everyone connected with them. A boo is bad news and it rubs off. Don't let it rub off on you. Do not prefer sympathy to the mentally ill. It's a bottomless pit. <laughs> Tell them firmly, I'm not paid to listen to this drill. You are eternal food. And avoid confirmed criminals. They are a special malignant strain of food. That day, I knew something awful was going to happen. I remember I was walking down the street and the tears started just streaming down my face. Well, if that happens to you, watch out, baby. You see, I've always felt myself to be controlled at some times by this completely malevolent force of which Brian described as the ugly spirit. But my walking down the street and tears streaming down my face meant that I knew that the ugly spirit, which is always the worst part of everyone's character, would take over and that something awful would happen. I took a knife that I'd bought in Ecuador uh, and left it with a knife sharpener to be sharpened. I went back to the um, apartment where we were all meeting and um, with this terrible sense of depression and foolishly, of course, in order to relieve the depression, I started tossing down the drinks. Then I said to Joan, it's about time for our William Tell Act. And she put a glass on her head, and I had this piece of uh, 380 junk. Just as she had said to Lucian, how fast can this heap go? I think she said to Bill, well, shoot that off my head. I'd buy the shot. The, go the glass hadn't been touched. Joan started sliding down towards the floor. Then Marcus said, walked over and took one look at her. He said, Bill, your bullet has hit her forehead. I said, oh my God. I always thought that she had kind of challenged him into it and led him into it. That it was sort of like using him to she was, in a sense, using him to get her off the earth, because I think she was in a great deal of pain. The ambulance came, the police came. I went down to uh, police headquarters with them. And I hadn't been there five minutes before my lawyer walks in. He said, don't say anything, Bill, don't say anything. Um, this is a shooting accident. Had you done the William Tell thing before? Never. Never. 
Just an absolute piece of insanity. You see, a writer can profit from things uh, that uh, uh, may be just unpleasant or boring to someone else because he uses those subsequently as material for writing. And I would say that the experience I had that's described in Junkie later read to my, led to my subsequent books like Naked Lunch, so I, I don't regret it. Incidentally, the uh, damage to health is minimal, no matter what the uh, American Narconics Department may say. Well, the damage to... Uh, the damage to health from, uh, from addiction is minimal. But it has done things to your soul. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, uh, We'll read one of the early authorities like De Quincey. Uh, for one thing, he would never live to be 72 unless he had taken opium because he had tuberculosis. And um, I think he would say the same as, uh, as I say, that he didn't regret his experience with drugs. Well, you can say, and I I'm, will not argue whether the yeah. permanent damage to health is, is, uh, uh, is severe. But uh, talk for a moment about, uh, about being on the bottom, if you would, about uh, what happens to, why, why do junkies never bathe? Now, this is a serious uh, question, not a, there's a, there's a physiological I thing. I don't know, they get like cats. They can't stand water on their skin for some reason or another. That's one of the symptoms that, yes, that you went through. one of the symptoms. They rarely bathe. What happens to your perception of reality? Well, it's always to be remembered that, uh, that uh, junk or any kind of uh, opiate is a painkiller, and therefore it will uh, lessen your perception of reality. What happens to your sexual appetite? Uh, practically non-existent. What, what happens to your appetites for food? Uh, it's, uh, it definitely reduces your appetite. What happens to your ability to cope with day-to-day -day crises? Nothing. Nothing whatever. Many, uh, many, see I was, uh, I've been in England where um, addicts obtained their heroin quite legally through doctors. And many of them, many of the addicts were lawyers, doctors, bank tellers, etc. Uh, so far as, crea as creative work goes, I say very definitely counterindicated. And I would never have uh, been able to write uh, Naked Lunch, for example, unless I'd been off heroin. Are you, William Burroughs, still a junkie? No. No, absolutely not. I haven't, uh, I haven't used, uh, become a, been addicted to opiates for years. No, but an alcoholic who is, who is not using alcohol will stand and, and say, I am an alcoholic. He will indeed, yes. And I'm still under that addiction. And you, you say that, you imply that through the book, that, you, that addiction stays with you. Are you not still addicted to heroin simply not having used it for many, many years? Uh, that's the question. It is not exactly the same problem as, um, as alcohol. As you know, an alcoholic can um, he can't drink a glass of beer. But if um, an addict goes to a hospital, say for an operation, and he takes the normal amount of medication that would be uh, admi uh, administered, uh, he doesn't necessarily become re-addicted. Then, if what you're saying is true, explain this quotation. Junk causes permanent cellular alteration. Once a junkie, always a junkie. You can stop using junk, but you are never off after the first habit. That's William Burroughs in Junkie. Yes. And uh, I would question that statement now. At that time, I had not taken uh, the apomorphine cure, which uh, 
I was the way I finally got off junk was through apomorphine. I take him with Dr. Dent in London. And um, after that cure, um, I, I would question that statement, whether there is a, uh, a permanent uh, cellular You do feel yourself permanently cured. Yeah, I do, yes. Yeah. In 1995, Sonic Youth was touring through the Midwest, and we went to visit William for what would become the first of a couple of visits to his house in Lawrence, Kansas. Thurston and I brought along Super 8 cameras. We took great pleasure in showing us jewel-encrusted knives, gun catalogs, his beloved cats, and the orgone box out back that he built for himself between the pond and the garden. You know, it's just, it's, there's just some fleeting impressions of William, of William here. I was... I was uh, very aware of wanting to uh, to actually document. We were shooting a lot of film that summer, uh, videotape of the tour and, and uh, Super 8 cameras, and it was just great fun to see William and to get to hang out with him and get to know him a little bit. He moved to Kansas in the 80s where he lived on an out-of-the-way street there in an old single-family house with his cats and his guns and his knives and with Jim Grauerholtz, I think. Lawrence, Kansas, sleepy university town, you know. He had a little house on an out-of-the-way street there. He showed us around his backyard. He was really interested in the occult. He built this orgone accumulator box, which was originally invented by Wilhelm Reich. It was the size of a small closet, and it looked like an outhouse. It was a bunch of plywood sheets with a hole cut in the door, and he would sit in there. I think Reich's theory was that sitting in there would allow you to gather certain accumulations of orgone energy. Here we are in the backyard, William's showing us around. That's his garage there where he was doing some of those shotgun paintings, or he was displaying them in there anyway. Here's the orgone box he's showing. He, William and Thurston are looking in on the orgone box that William built in his backyard. He had a typewriter in his backyard. I took some pictures of it. It was, it was deep in the weeds with uh, vines growing out of the out through the keys and it was sort of uh, becoming a part of the earth back there. He had a bunch of different weird objects in his garden in the backyard. He had an old car that had uh, weeds growing up through the floorboards and stuff like that, but his typewriter for, for a writer, as that, for the writer that William was, really intrigued me somehow. So here we're looking at his pond in the backyard. This is the first time we went. The second time we went, William had built a new pond in the backyard and, and uh, he was showing us that when we went there and when we took uh, Michael Stipe with us to, to visit him. He's showing us around his backyard. He was very proud of his little house. He really enjoyed it. And he was just living, you know, living away from everybody. Just, just living by himself. Here he is walking with Terry, our sound man, looking around the backyard. He showed us his cats. He had a lot of cats running around. Here he's signing uh, one of the one of the books. We of course we all brought different books for him to sign. So he's signing uh, Terry's uh, copy of Naked Lunch, I think. William Burroughs is an artist, influence, and role model for generations of outsiders, bohemians, beatniks, hippies, and now the new wave who've infected the bloodstream of America with their occasionally dangerous visions. Burroughs' own vision of the world has been filtered through an awesome catalog of books, records, and performances, but their creator is an elusive man, difficult to entrap with convenient labels. But no matter what the label, Burroughs believes wholeheartedly in the importance and integrity of his art. The purpose of art, the function of art, and of all creative thought as I see it, is to make people aware of what they know and don't know what they know. Like people living on the seacoast in the Middle Ages, they knew the earth was round, they believed the earth was flat. And uh, people couldn't see that Cezanne was uh, painting something in a different light and from a different angle. They couldn't see that this was a pair. Well, then after a while, this becomes part of general awareness, so any child can see Cezanne now. And uh, Joyce, who was considered uh, quite in, uh, unintelligible at one time, when he made people aware of their own stream of consciousness, 
on one level. So uh, once the breakthrough is made, then it becomes part of general awareness, like everyone but the flat earth group really is ready to concede that the earth is round. <clears throat> It kicks like a mule, babe. I want something to shoot. <laughs> Again, if you had your choice, would you rather be a poisonous snake or a non-poisonous snake? I bring not peace, but a sword.